Hi, everybody. I would like you all to please stand up. We're going to have our service now, and I want us all to be excited because we're going to learn something new today, like hopefully we always do. If we focus, you're going to see that maybe God has something to tell you tonight. Let's put away our worries right now, the things that have been driving us crazy this whole week, right? Or sometimes we just come here after doing absolutely nothing, and we're just like, my week has been so ugh. You know what? Today is a day that we get to worship Jesus, and we get to have a beautiful time with our family, which is us, and we get to see everything he's done for us, and then we get to learn something new from the Bible. So with that, I hope you guys do have your Bible. If you don't, I hope you have your Bible app, because it's not, there's no point in coming to church without learning more from the Word of God and getting closer to Jesus. So let's pray, and let's ask God to be with everything that's going to happen tonight. May He be glorified today and that we could see how awesome he is in our lives. Jesus, thank you so much for this beautiful night you've given us, for these opportunities you give us to be able to worship you. I ask you to please humble us and let us be ready to give you everything. I ask you to please be with every note, every word that is spoken today. Guide it, Father, and let your name be glorified tonight. Let us be closer to you, Father, and also learn how to be closer to each other, forgiving and loving and patient. Thank you again for all the beautiful blessings you give us. It is in your name, Jesus, that we all pray. Amen. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough then you came along and put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. And I'm not afraid. To show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You turn morning to dancing. You get beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn morning to dancing. You get beauty for ashes. 
you turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you.
Revelations 5 9 it says and they sang a new song saying you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God's persons from every tribe and language and people and nation Carried a burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go. And I see it now, I'm laying it down, I know that I need you. I run to the Father, I fall in the grace, I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh, oh, oh. You saw my condition. Had a plan from the start. Your son for redemption, the price for my heart. And I don't have a context for that kind of love. I don't understand, I can't comprehend. All I know is I need you. I run to the Father, I fall in the grace, I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait, my heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend, so I run to the Father again and again and again and again. Mercy is coming out Just as I am You pull me in I know I need you now And I feel this rush Deep in my chest Your mercy is coming out Just as I am I know I need you now. Run to the Father, fall in the grace. I'm done with the hiding, reason away. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I run to the Father again and again. 
I'll run to the Father, body in the grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a certain, my soul needs a friend. So I run to the Father again and again and again and again. to me because it's considered a hymn but I find it a little more modern in the way that it's done um, it says amazing grace shall always be my song of praise for it was grace that bought my liberty I do not know just why he came to love me so he looked beyond my fault and saw my need the chorus says I shall forever lift mine eyes to Calvary Calvary is the cross of Christ to view the cross where Jesus died for me. How marvelous the grace that caught my, faith, my falling soul. He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. Um, this year I've been wanting us to focus more on the sacrifice of Jesus and everything he's done for us in our lives. We get really confused sometimes, worried about everything that's happening around us, like the lights and how pretty we sound or how good we smell or like, is my friend coming or I can't stand that person or hopefully that's not happening in your life, but I mean, we're human, right? And we deal with things every day and we forget that Jesus has redeemed us, Jesus has died for us, and not only that, he resurrected and he's all powerful and he can do whatever he wants for us. You know what that, you know what that means? He loves you and he's gonna do the best for you because that's what he did for you. He gave up his everything. So this song means a lot to me because of that, and I hope you guys hear it and then sing it really loud with me so you can feel what I have felt of redemption and forgiveness in my life. Amazing grace shall always be my song of praise For it was grace that bought my liberty I do not know just why he came to love me so. He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. I shall forever lift my eyes to Calvary to view.
sin, Father. Thank you so much for loving each and every one of us. And I ask you to please always help us remember that you're always there and that you do love us no matter what and that you are so forgiving. You are gracious to us. You're always there as a father. I ask you to please be with Joe now. Fill him with your spirit, Father, with the fire of the word that you have in your Bible. I ask you to please speak to our hearts now and let us be not interrupted by anything around us and be listening to the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, we all pray. Amen. Testing. All right, there we are. What's up, guys? Glad that you're here. Next time I'll locate the mic. I thought it was going to be over here. I'm sorry. If you would take out your phone, that QR code will take you to all the verse, verses uh, for this evening. All the verses for this evening. And uh, it's going to be uh, in the NET Bible. I love that translation. And it's going to be through Bible Gateway. And so all you have to do is scroll down as we go. Uh, today we're talking about um, the cost that Jesus paid when he took upon the cross. And I love that hymn. I had no idea you were going to sing it. That was the fourth song, if I was counting. And so it was a special. Usually we do three. And so I was caught off guard. And I'll, I will love that. I think we need to sing that until we, you know, we burn it. Um, I have like this ADHD thing where like if I like something, we'll just listen to that one song. I watched that same show like over and over and over again, uh, like for, for years. And that's definitely one of those songs, Sarah. That's an amazing song. Who sings that song? You know, is it a, is it a hymn? It's an old hymn? Dude, it is better than 99% of everything that's out right now. It's such a great song. I will always lift my eyes to view Calvary. All of my days, I'll look to the cross. What a beautiful, beautiful text. As you're preparing uh, your phone to be used not for TikTok or endless scrolling on Instagram, but to look at these Bible verses. There's one passage uh, that we'll mention that it won't be in that list, but I'll, I'll mention it to you and make sure you have it. Uh, but if you're taking notes, and I encourage you to do so, because as we're going through this series called Christology 101, as we're looking at the life, the ministry, the death, the sacrifice, um, all of the works of Christ, and essentially or eventually uh, his ascension and his intercession for us towards the end of our series, um, it's important for you to continue to amass all of this information. And there is a QR code up there that actually will link you to um, all of my notes. So as I go updating this one Google Doc, you can have my notes and follow along with me. And it, yeah, Martin, if you, please, bro, where was it, man? It's in the back. Did they just hide it? Anyway. Uh, today we're going to be all over the place, and um, there's four points. Should I go? I'm going to go down there. That's a better idea. No, 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 that's fine, dude. I'll go right there. Say thank you, Martin. Everyone say thank you, Martin. Thank you, Martin. You're awesome. Um, if you're taking notes, the title of today's talk is, How Much Did It Cost? Unless you're balling, um, unless you have a lot of money, you like me, or balling on a budget. And you always ask the question before you're going to, you know, swipe the card, whether it be at McDonald's 
or the store, you buy, you buy your clothes at Ross, or, you know, if you're super famous at Target, you ask the question, how much this is going to cost, right? Or you look at, uh, if you have a car and it breaks, and you go to the mechanic, and you say, how much does it cost, right? To know the cost of something, you expect to have a number, right? And in math, uh, and for me, math has always been a poor subject, but at certain points, mathematics becomes irrelevant to us, right? On the screen, I just want you to look at, and not that it teaches us anything, because one number on that screen is equal to the same amount in my mind. There's no concept for the differences, but let's take a look at um, whoever came up with these numbers. I don't know how they count this stuff, but scientists, I imagine, will tell us that there are 10 octillion stars in the known universe. That number means nothing to me, right? Past like a billion, I have no concept of what that looks like. But this is, this is crazy. Seven quadrillion, 500 trillion grains of sand on planet Earth. That's, that's amazing. This is, there's, no, there's no teaching point. This is an illustration, right? But this, we're just going to look at this and be like, wow, like none of this matters at all to me because these numbers are too gigantic. All right, look at this other one. This is how long it would take to travel from one end, uh, from, from our end of the universe all the way to the end of the known universe. And it would be 273 sextillion, 140 quintillion years. That's nuts. Seven sextillion cells in the body and 10 dual decillion atoms in the observable universe. And that one's my favorite because look at all those zeros. Like at what point, at what point do you're just like, yeah, it's just a big number, right? At certain point, math becomes irrelevant, right? It's just too much. The calculation is too big. The question I want you to think about is how much greater than this is the infinite cost of what Christ gave when he paid for our sins on that cross of Calvary. There are smart people in places that they don't let us in that they're calculating these numbers. And these things, however immense they are, have a number. There's a fixed point. There's not an, another zero that you can add to that last infinite amount of zeros, right? It, it has a fixed number. But the question, theologically speaking, how much did it cost for Christ to suffer, spiritually speaking? How much did it cost for Jesus to suffer in his soul, in his spirit, when he, providing atonement or forgiveness, or like what Sarah was saying, redemption for the world, how much would it cost? Or how much did it cost? There's a song um, it's called Here I Am to Worship. And there's a bridge. It says, I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. And what a beautiful line to remind us that there is an impossible number, an infinite value attached to what Jesus paid when he paid for our sins. If you're taking notes, the first point I want you to note is the cost of sin. The cost of sin. Have you ever considered what your sin cost Christ? Have you ever asked the question, what your falling into temptations, letting your eyes wander, your mind just travel where it will, letting your hands and feet do and go places that you know it shouldn't? Have you ever asked yourself the question, what does it cost or what did it cost God for me to live against his will? If you look in the verses that, we, that I sent to you or that you uh, at this point should have already on your phone, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 36, we get a glimpse at the inner turmoil of Christ as he is anticipating the passion, anticipating the suffering that he would have to endure. And he prays. And after dining with his disciples, his friends, he goes out to the Garden of Gethsemane. He goes out to pray by himself, but not alone. He needs to pray by himself, but he's, he doesn't go alone. And he brings close friends. And when he needs his friends the most, they're silence because they're asleep. They're snoring in the background while he is facing the hardest challenge of all of his life and really the hardest challenge of all of humanity. He goes a little further, the Bible says, and he threw himself down with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if possible, let this cup pass from me. And the question that I ask 
to the text and even for you to think about is what was in the cup. What was in the cup that Jesus pleading with his face to the ground all by himself, pleading with the one person who had the answer, what was in the cup that made our Savior tremble, that made our Savior ask with one last chance, is there any other way to bring redemption? God, is there any, Father, is there any other way to bring about the forgiveness of sins to the world? Is there any other way, Father, for this cup to pass from me? And he says, yet not what I will, but what you will. Not my will be done, but your will be done. And there, along with the silence of the disciples, as they slept, he received no answer from heaven. The answer for Jesus that evening in the silence of God's lack of response to his prayer was that no, there is no other way. That for the sins of the world, for my sins and for your sins, for the sins of every person, every man and woman, it must be, it must be the cup. What was in the cup? What was in the cup? That's the question that everyone, everyone tonight, I, I, I ask you that you would think about. What was in the cup that made the Lord of the universe tremble if it wasn't the full price of your sin and my sin if it wasn't the full wrath of God the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God in this passage, we learn that Christ was not guilty and could not be made guilty, but he was treated as if he were guilty because he willed to stand in the place of the guilty. What was in the cup was what you and I deserved. What was reserved for us in all of eternity for the sins that we've committed because truly before God, we are actually guilty. But Jesus taking our place, standing in our place, he became looked upon as the guilty one. He became sin who knew no sin so that we might become, we might be given or imputed or accredited or accounted as righteous. What did it cost Jesus? What was the cost of sin? The cost of sin was everything. It was an undefinable, unattainable number of things, an infinite value. What is the price of a, of a beautiful mansion? Well, someone might say a hundred million. What is the price of a million mansions? And you would just take that number and multiply it. But what is the value of one person's life? One might say, well, it's impossible to quantify. And what of that of seven billion people? And it said an even number greater than that. But when Jesus died and he bled on the cross, God looked upon him and said, the one drop of Jesus' blood is greater than all the sin and the condemnation and the consequence of every man and every woman who had ever lived. What is the value of Jesus' life? What man or woman could ever imagine? Infinite. He became sin so that we might be the righteousness of God. In Isaiah 53, verses 5 and 6, it says, prophesied about the Messiah. Looking into the future, Isaiah writes that, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. What was the price? What was the cost of sin? The cost of sin was to take the blameless Lamb of God, the perfect Son of Man, the creator of the universe incarnate, and put him to death. This is what we remember as we reflect on Easter when we remember the, his death and his resurrection, Good Friday and Easter Sunday, we remember what Jesus has done for us and that we would never forget that the cost of sin is greater than any man or any woman could ever identify or count. And he did this 
And I'm going to say this hopefully more times than you're willing to hear. He did this. Not because he had to. Not because you compelled him. Not because he looked down the corridors of time and saw that you had faith or you were a good person or he saw something in you that motivated him to do these things. No, Jesus paid the full price of sin. He covered the entirety of the cost of sin, leaving you without a debt to pay to God simply because he loved you, simply because he wanted to, and because it glorified God to demonstrate mercy and kindness to those who could never earn it or deserve it. And with this, everyone should be lifted and encouraged and reminded that God loves you. The next thing I want you to take note of is the weight of wrath. The weight of wrath. Again, asking the question, what was in the cup? We just read a passage where it says in Isaiah that God laid upon him the iniquity of all of us. That on Jesus' shoulders, every sin that you and I have committed, every shameful thing we have done, all of it upon the back of Christ. And he took it willingly. No one forced him. He took it lovingly. No one coerced him. He did it because he knew that you could never carry your burden. How many of us? How many of us have things in our life that we wish we could erase? That we wish we could, uh, like with a, I don't know, a hypnotist, just erase from our memory. Things that we've done. Things that we've done to ourselves. Things that we've done to other people. That we wish that we could forget. What about the things that people have done to us? Secret, terrible things that have happened to us that we've had to endure, whether in our childhood or whether in our young adulthood years, we have had to go through because of other people's mistakes. What is the weight of wrath? The weight of wrath is all of your shame, all of your sin, all of your guilt, all of your baggage, all of your addictions, all of your sufferings, all of your shortcomings, every bad thing that you've ever done, every bad thing that someone has done to you, all the bad in the world from tornadoes to hurricanes to floods to stubbed toes to losing your keys to like diseases like cancer, all of it, the guilt, the shame, all of it laid upon Christ. There is not one thing on this earth that we can say Jesus has not paid for. I've said it before here, and I'd like to repeat this because I think this is important and not enough people say it. There are a lot of people with answers about why bad things happen. A lot of apologists like to give answers. And I stood in line with them with a, a quick answer or a, or a very well thought theological reason why bad things happen. And let me tell you, there are a lot of good explanations that make sense. They follow logic. But the truth is this, that I don't know why bad things happen. I don't know. Specifically, like with enough detail that's going to satisfy your heart and your questions, I don't know. I don't know why bad things happen to me. I don't know why bad things happen to you. I don't know why bad things happen in, in the world. I can give you some answers, right? Some some incomplete, as best as I possibly can, answers like, well, there's sin and, and man has free will and, and God is working all things for his glory and all of those things are true. But there's still a part of us that says, but what is the reason? And the answer temporarily, because we'll know all things in eternity, is that, is that I don't know. But here's what I do hold on to. There isn't anything that is broken or wrong about this world that when Jesus took his body to the cross, that the weight of that sin, the weight of that punishment wasn't laid upon him. There isn't anything on this earth that you can say, who will bring justice? When will this be made right? Because you can, in the one moment of history, look at Christ and say, all things were made new. And even though we do not get to enjoy the fruits of that labor immediately, I do know this, that in eternity, every thing will be made new. But the weight of wrath, it's important for you to know that, that the weight of your shame and your sin 
even now, as we speak, those who don't have a relationship with Christ, or even those who have a relationship with Christ who have been far away, or maybe those who don't understand the forgiveness that God has given us, we feel the heaviness on our backs, weight in our hearts. David talks about in the Psalms that our bones break within us. And that is just yours. That's just your guilt. That's just your frustration. But the weight of all of it, the entirety of everything, the Bible teaches us in a way that I don't pretend to understand or pretend to be able to explain to you, was placed upon Christ. And God crushed his son and his son gave his life willingly so that you and I would not have to carry all of that for the rest of our life, certainly not for the rest of our life, and more importantly, for all of eternity. How much did it cost? It cost Jesus to bear the full weight of the wrath of God. The holy disgust and rejection towards things that taint and destroy the beautiful image of God that God has stamped on every one of our hearts, though that anger that he has to that which destroys his beloved creation, he placed all of that justice upon Christ, leaving you free from it all so that you don't have to walk around with any guilt or shame. In Isaiah 53, verse 10, it says, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Jesus gets the grief, and we get the prosperity. Matthew 27, 46. In about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out, with a loud voice, words that we, because of Christ, never have to utter ever. Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani. That is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Quoting Psalms 22 verses 1 and 2 and maybe even referencing the whole Psalms all together. Where it says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer.